So thanks for coming. Today we're very pleased to have with us Vijay Vazirani from Georgia Tech. Uh, Vijay probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway, a brief one. Um, he got his bachelor's degree from MIT in 79 and his PhD from Berkeley in 83. Um, by the way, we are going to be taping this for uh, Google Video, so please keep confidential questions uh, outside of the video. Um, but uh, a couple other things. Vijay is very well known for his work in algorithms, including combinatorial optimization, approximation algorithms, randomized algorithms, parallel algorithms, and mathematical economics, and some of the work, more recent work he's going to be talking about today. Um, many of you probably know his 2001 book on approximation algorithms, which is kind of considered the definitive book in that area. He's also a fellow of the ACM and also uh, was recently a Mackay Fellow at UC Berkeley. So we're very pleased to have Vijay here. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to be talking about markets and the dual, primal dual paradigm. Thank you. Yeah, it's really a, a great uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, in some sense, uh, the mecca of, uh, of today's uh, internet uh, explosion <laughs> right here in, uh, in your backyard. Um, so uh, let me uh, get this rolling first. Uh, OK. So I'm going to talk about markets, uh, and some of them should be very familiar to you. Um, so um, um, the notion of a market, as you know, is a, is a very ancient one. Uh, um, but it has undergone uh, numerous changes uh, through the ages. Uh, so for instance, when stock markets got introduced, uh, all of a sudden we had uh, new markets uh, that uh, were ne never there before. For instance, when, when stock markets uh, were introduced, uh, you could suddenly sell something that you never owned. But the only thing is that you have to buy it back later at a certain point. So you could do things that were inconceivable before. Uh, and with the internet, uh, there's been another huge revolution in the definition of a market. And uh, you folks are some of the prime suspects here uh, in this revolution. Uh, uh, and there's also a massive computational power available for running these uh, markets that are internet-based, uh, either in a centralized or a distributed manner. And so it's really important to find uh, algorithms for these markets and new models that uh, capture these new markets. Um, and fortunately, at this point, we also have a very powerful, uh, uh, a very well-studied uh, deep theory of algorithms uh, with very powerful techniques. And uh, we can draw on it uh, in, in a big way to help us uh, with our development of algorithms. Uh, what's really interesting, and for me the most exciting aspect of this work, is that there's also traffic in the other direction. So the study of markets, this algorithmic study of markets, has given rise to some really fundamental insights to the theory of algorithms. And I'll talk about those as well. Uh, so uh, can I assume everybody knows this market? Yeah? OK, normally my question is, uh, can I assume that everybody knows about this company uh, called uh, Google? <laughs> OK. But then I have to talk about the AdWords market, typically. So anyway, so, um, so, I, I, so that's, that's really um, an incredibly exciting, uh, incredibly innovative market, with, uh, which has you know, totally revolutionized uh, uh, advertising and made possible Google uh, available at desktops 24-7 uh, for free. Um, so I mean, these are amazing developments, uh, probably even bigger than the stock market. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and there's, of course, huge promise. Uh, huge amount of uh, growth is expected in these markets. So it's very important to study them for their own sake. Uh, so let's start uh, uh, from the beginning, though, of the study of markets. Uh, and that was uh, really of central importance in the West, because uh, the Western economy was based on a capitalistic system. Uh, and so pricing mechanisms were doing everything for us. Every, every important function was simply relegated to pricing mechanisms, functions that you would have uh, um, given to some very wise and benevolent person uh, in, a, in, a, in a more socialistic environment, uh, you know, like determining prices, determining who's rich, who's poor, who gets what, whether the markets are efficient, fair, stable. And so mathematical economics devoted uh, a good part of itself to the study of markets in a formal mathematical setting. And uh, 
this particular setting was called uh, general equilibrium theory. And without a doubt, uh, this was the crown jewel of mathematical economics. Uh, it was pioneered by a French uh, economist, uh, Leon Walras, uh, and it soon moved to uh, the Bay Area, where uh, the big, uh, uh, the, the, the central theorem of this uh, theory was proven, uh, the arrow de Broux theorem. Mm. And that established the existence of equilibrium, and I'll talk about equilibrium at, at length in a moment, um, under some very general conditions using uh, Kakotani's fixed point theorem, which is a theorem in topology. And uh, notice here that uh, they, they, it wasn't sufficient to use uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem, which is based in analysis, but Kakotani's, which is based in topology. So it's a very abstract theorem. And uh, as a result, uh, there was no way to translate this theorem into an algorithm. Okay. Um, but uh, Kenneth Arrow, who is a professor emeritus at uh, Stanford, uh, got a Nobel Prize for this work in uh, 72. And I, I was just in Stanford uh, three days ago and met him for the first time. So quite a meeting. Uh, and uh, Gerard Drebru, who was at uh, Berkeley but passed away a couple of years ago, was the other uh, author on that theorem. Um, so, so not only is the arrow debris theorem itself highly uh, non-constructive, but also this entire theory was almost entirely non-algorithmic other than a few isolated results. Uh, and somehow that should be expected because uh, uh, these were economists, they were not algorithms people, and, and you know, it's our job to do the algorithmic as, uh, version of this theory. And, uh, and uh, that's what is needed today. And, and, and inherently algorithmic theory of market equilibria and new models to capture some of these new markets. Uh, so, so the beginnings of such a theory has taken shape over the last five or six years uh, within this uh, re relatively nascent field called algorithmic game theory, which you most of you must have heard of. Uh, it's really a, a, a field motivated by the internet. Uh, and I'll say more about how these uh, algorithms and game theory have come together in, a, in such a big way to make this new field happen. Um, and the study of markets within this field started with uh, combinatorial algorithms for some of the traditional market models given by Walras and other people. Yeah? Uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, but, but yeah, f feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, yeah, and, and, and new markets are, new uh, ma market models are emerging, and I'll talk about one. It's not easy to give such models, uh, and you'll see why, because uh, you know, if you have a new market model, it should capture one of the new markets uh, in a very uh, simple way, but, but in a way that's precise enough for, for it to be useful. It should also be amenable to good, uh, 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 efficient al algorithms, and it should have some nice properties that these traditional market models have. Uh, and I'll show you what I consider an example of that, uh, but you are the final judge on that, really. Uh, so coming back to the notion of an equilibrium, so the central tenet in, uh, in general equilibrium theory is that uh, there should be parity between supply and demand, and prices should be such that they maintain this parity. And these are called equilibrium prices. And this is very easy to achieve if there's only one good in the market, because you just look at the demand and supply curves and see where they intersect. And uh, that's the place where, uh, th th that's what determines the, the, the prices. Oh, at least this works. Yeah. So, and uh, if you move away from these equilibrium prices one way or the other, there'll be forces that force it back into equilibrium. Um, so, on the other hand, if you have uh, multiple goods and multiple people, then uh, it is uh, not even easy to define a, a, a clean model that captures this notion of parity between supply and demand. And what we're gonna study today, uh, or, or rather look at, look at algorithms for today, is, is a, really a fundamental model given by Irving Fisher in 1891. Uh, and he was a, a PhD student at Yale, uh, uh, when, he, when he did this work. Uh, 
And in some sense, this work was contemporary with that of Walras, independent of Walras. Uh, so here's uh, his model. So imagine a market with some goods, uh, some given amounts of these goods. And these are infinitely divisible goods, unlike, uh, say, cars or trucks, which you cannot really divide. Uh, and let's say that some, uh, a buyer comes to this market. Uh, that's your favorite uh, Uncle Scrooge with uh, some money that he wants to spend in this market. Okay. Um, now, he has uh, linear utility functions for these goods. Uh, and I'm assuming linear just because that's the easiest case to consider, and I'll soon, soon switch out of that case. So, so here's his happiness function as a function of uh, the amount of milk that he gets in this market. That's how his happiness goes. And uh, similarly, he has uh, another linear uh, utility function for bread and for cheese. And his total utility, given a bundle of these goods, is just the sum of the utilities on all these three goods. And uh, if we fix the prices of these goods at any value, say P1, P2, and P3, then we can also compute what is uh, his optimal bundle of goods uh, given this money that he has to spend in the market. Right? That's a simple linear programming problem, and we can solve that. Um, so now imagine that uh, many, many more ducks come to this market with their own monies and their own utility functions. So we have several goods, fixed amount of each good, several buyers with their money and utility functions. And you want to find equilibrium prices. By that I mean that these are prices such that if each buyer gets an optimal bundle, then there's no deficiency or surplus of any of the goods. Okay. So all the money gets spent, and all the get, uh, goods get used up to the last drop. And there's no deficiency or surplus of any of the goods. And that's the condition of parity between supply and demand. Right? I mean, that's a, really a natural way to capture this notion in the case of multiple goods and buyers. Uh, if, if this model is clear, uh, if this model is not clear, then we should stop. And, and, and really, I, I, please feel free to uh, stop me any, at any point for anything. So if the last condition necessary, you can always define the cash, uh, good, which is cash, and then define, and then there won't be any efficiency. Uh, that's, uh, uh, We'll do it in a different way. For, for now, let's, let's say that this is the, the definition. Th that's a complication, and it might you know, weaken the whole definition otherwise. So let's, let's not go to that right now. Okay. Let's say that all the money get, has to get used up, and, and all the, the goods have to be sold. And we'll, we'll bring in, in utility of money soon. Okay. You're not happy. Oh, it's fine. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'm wondering, so he's never happy. Doesn't the, uh, doesn't the utility function have to be nonlinear for each buyer to have? I'm not saying that each buyer has a unique optimal bundle. I'm just saying, uh, yeah, in fact, with linear utilities, each buyer will have uh, per perhaps infinitely many bu uh, optimal bundles. But that's, that's OK. As long as everybody gets an optimal bundle, we, we give them an optimal bundle. right? And then all the goods need to clear. Buy just one thing. Good, excellent question. Yeah, uh, excellent question. Did everybody hear that question? So, wouldn't it be that in because we have linear utility functions, everybody will just buy one thing? And yes, this will uh, typically be the case. And that's why I'm saying this is. Uh, think of this as markets 101. You know, and and linear utilities is is not the place to stop. But let me tell you that this is not an easy case to handle either, algorithmically. So we at least need to <laughs> solve this. Uh, okay, so um, Irving Fisher um, actually was way ahead of his times um, and actually thought about the computational aspect of, of this question of finding equilibrium prices. And he gave this hydraulic apparatus uh, for computing equilibria for three goods and three people. Okay, so these, uh, these cisterns here encode the particular utility functions, and uh, he was thinking of concave utility functions for the reason that somebody here said that you know, the, the optimal bundle should be unique. Uh, and there are all these levers here connected uh, some, somehow. 
And uh, once you fill it to, uh, with water up to a certain point and let all the levers settle down, then uh, uh, you can read off the, the prices of the three goods. Okay. Uh, so first of all, this doesn't scale. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, secondly, uh, um, Herb Fisher, who's a, a very distinguished uh, economist uh, at uh, Yale, uh, tried to build this machine and he failed, uh, even though Irving Fisher in the previous century had ma made two of them. <laughs> uh, uh, but they, then uh, Herb, uh, Herb uh, Scarf and, uh, and his students did program up uh, uh, to, see, to simulate this uh, machine on a computer, and that worked. And you can actually find a, a paper on his homepage saying uh, how to compute equilibrium prices in 1891. That's fairly long ago. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by showing you, first of all, a combinatorial polynomial time algorithm for, for, this, for finding equilibrium prices for this market, the, the linear case of Fisher's model, which uh, we found uh, about five years ago, uh, uh, we being uh, Christos Papadimitriou, who's uh, on the faculty at Berkeley, uh, uh, Nikhil Devanur, who is a student of mine, just graduated. Uh, Amin Saberi, who was a student of mine, but now is a uh, assistant professor at Stanford. And uh, I was on a sabbatic at Berkeley with these two students uh, at that time. And, and we found uh, this algorithm based on the primal dual uh, uh, paradigm, uh, which you perhaps know here. Is a, is, a, is a very, very fundamental algorithm design technique. Uh, it has uh, led to uh, algorithms for these very, very basic uh, problems in P, and uh, really good algorithms uh, with good running times and good approximation factors for all these NP hard problems. Uh, and, and you know, the, 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 these problems have many, many uh, applications uh, in the industry. Uh, are, these are all very famous problems. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, two years ago, uh, the, uh, in Hungary, they celebrated the 50th anniversary of the discovery of this uh, primal dual schema. Uh, it was given by Harald Kuhn uh, in a paper that was called The Hungarian Method for the Assignment Problem. Uh, and he gave it for this algorithm for, uh, for the assignment problem, which is weighted bipartite matching. And he called it the Hungarian method because of reverence to the Hungarian combinators who had been studying uh, matching for, for decades before this. And of course, it's fitting that uh, the celebration was in Budapest. Um, OK, so, so in, in all these algorithms that I showed you, uh, whether, whether they were exact or approximation, uh, the primal dual set, uh, schema is uh, run in the setting of linear programming and LP duality. So you end up solving a particular linear program, either exactly or approximately, getting integral solutions to the, to the variables. Uh, the special uh, aspect of our setting is that there are no known LPs that capture uh, equilibrium allocations for Fisher's model. OK, so how are we going to use the primal dual schema? Well, it turns out that there is, uh, though, a nonlinear convex program whose optimal solution captures equilibrium allocations. OK, and uh, what is needed is um, an extension of uh, the primal dual schema from its uh, original setting of linear programming theor uh, duality theory to nonlinear pro uh, convex programming. And that involves, you know, KKT conditions and a lot more. So uh, I will certainly give you a, a gist of the algorithm, and uh, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll I'll, I'll see uh, take you as far as you feel like going into the into the deeper aspects uh, of uh, how the primal dual schema is adapted uh, to uh, this new setting. Uh, and there's a, a lot more to talk about, so, so if you don't want to go into the technical details, uh, you can skip those and go into the new markets, which is what, where Google really comes in. So please, uh, I'd love to get your feedback on, on those aspects. 
Okay, so uh, um, so let me define uh, Fisher's linear case uh, very formally, very precisely. So so we have n buyers, and M I is the money that buyer I came to the market with. Okay, and uh, we have k goods, and we can assume that we have a unit amount of each good, without loss of generality, because we can uh, we can uh, just scale the utility functions appropriately. And uh, let's say that U I J is the utility derived by buyer I uh, when she obtains one unit of good J. Okay, and we know these U I Js for all I and J. So, so if uh, buyer I's full allocation is X I J for each value of J. So, so I will be buyers and J will be goods. So suppose I give you the entire allocation of buyer I, so I know X I J for each value of J, for each good J, uh, and this is a number between zero and one because we have one unit of each good. Uh, then this linear uh, sum gives me the total happiness derived by buyer I from this allocation. Um, and of course, uh, in the setting, we want to find market clearing prices, which means prices such that uh, relative to them, if each buyer gets an optimal bundle of goods, all the goods clear completely, exactly, and all the money gets spent. Right? So that's uh, that will be the formal statement of the problem. Uh, so before going into an algorithm for that problem, let me uh, show you an algorithm for an easier question, which is, Suppose I give you some prices P for the goods, P1 through Pn. Uh, tell me if they are equilibrium prices, and if so, tell me some uh, uh, one, one way of uh, making allocations which are equilibrium allocations so that the market clears. And that's a reasonable goal. It's certainly, if you can compute equilibrium prices, we should be able to determine this at least, whether or not some given prices are equilibrium prices. Just a yes, no question there. And uh, uh, one interesting uh, fa uh, fact about this market is that uh, equilibrium prices are unique. Uh, and that, that's a very good property to have because uh, equilibrium means you have stability, right? That there are operating points in the market where there's parity between supply and demand. That's what you would really like in the market. You won't, don't want huge uh, changes and turmoil. But now if you have two different equilibria, couldn't you be oscillating between these two, right? So in this market, uh, there's only a, a, a unique equilibrium price, so that's, that's, that's very favorable for us. Um, now, let's define this uh, notion of a, a bank per buck, which is happiness per dollar spent. So we are given these prices P, which we want to test whether they are equilibrium prices. So, so for buyer I, Let's see what are her most desirable goods. So, so UIJ is the happiness derived by buyer I by getting one unit of good J. PJ is the price of one unit of good J. So the ratio is the happiness derived by buyer I on spending one dollar on good J, right? So it's bang per buck. And, and if we take the max of these over all the goods, those, so, so whatever are the goods that achieve this maximum are the only ones that give uh, buyer I happiness, maximum happiness, and the only ones that she'll be really interested in, in the case of linear functions. And to take your uh, question, uh, sorry, your comment that there'll typically be only one good, typically, that achieves this maximum, unless there's an accident and, and these ra ratios are equal for two goods. Mm -hmm. So let S be this set of goods uh, that achieve this maximum, and any goods uh, worth uh, MI dollars from the set S constitute uh, buyer I's optimal bundle, right? Uh, so let's put down a graph where we have a vertex for each buyer, and these are the monies that they came to the market with, and a vertex for each uh, good, and these are the prices of the goods. And remember, we have assumed one unit of each good, so this is also the total value of this good that's available. Uh, P1 is the total value of good one available, P2 the total value of good two available, and so on. Okay. And we have put a, an edge from this buyer to this good if this is uh, her bank per buck good, her, her best possible good. So, 
this buyer happens to have two best possible goods, this only one, and so on. Okay. Now, now how do we know whether, how do we test whether or not these prices P are equilibrium prices? Well, there'll be equilibrium prices if and only if this entire value sees this entire value using only these edges, right? So at this point, it should be obvious that we should think of this as a flow problem. Uh, put down a source vertex here, and these edges with capacities equal to the prices. Make these edges be of infinite capacity, and put capacities here equal to the monies that these people came to the market with, and do a max flow. Okay? And if in that max flow, both of these cuts are min cuts, are saturated, in other words, then we know that this value sees this value exactly using exactly these edges, and so these are equilibrium prices, right? And yes, sir? Is that sufficient as well? It's necessary for it to happen. Yeah, it, it is sufficient also, yeah. The algorithm shows that it's sufficient, yeah. And uh, that, that this will happen eventually, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, and uh, there could be many different max flows in this graph, but any one of them will give you equilibrium allocations. Because you know, once you know how much flow goes on each edge, you divide the flow by the price, and you know how much good, how much of this good this person got. Right. So uh, that's great. We managed to solve one easy problem at least. But how do we find prices? So, so this was in case you were given the prices. But how do we find these prices? So the idea of the algorithm is to to run this primal dual uh, process. And the primal variables will be allocations. So what, what, what is flowing on these edges, these edges, that will be the primal variables at any point in this iterative algorithm. And the dual variables will be the current prices of the goods. And what we'll do is that we will uh, start the algorithm at very low prices. So think of these as equilibrium prices. We start with very low prices, which are guaranteed to be less than the equilibrium prices at, at each good. And then uh, uh, at these prices, of course, all goods can be sold, but buyers will have surplus money left. Okay? And the whole idea of the algorithm is to keep raising these prices gradually so that the surplus keeps de depleting. And when the surplus vanishes, we'll have equilibrium. Okay? So, so this is a bit different from an algorithm that, that you may think of where you take some prices and raise them, and maybe prices go beyond the equilibrium price, and then you bring them down. Okay? But if, you, if you're going to do that kind of a scheme where you go above and below the equilibrium, then it turns out that it's very difficult to prove a, a good running time for those kinds of algorithms. People have tried, I mean, very, very hard to, to bound running times of those kinds of algorithms, and, and just doesn't work. So that's why we're going to approach equilibrium prices from below and never exceed equilibrium prices. What okay? about in practice when, hmm? you actually, when you actually run the, you know? This, you cannot prove uh, polynomial termination. Right, but in practice, um, we, you don't know whether it's below or. Yeah, it may work out for a few goods and few people, but if you go to more goods, then you know, it may take forever. So, so the idea, again, is primal dual. So we, we have these initial prices. With respect to this, we get allocations. But uh, buyers have surplus money. But these allocations tell us how to improve the prices, increase the prices, in other words. And then we get allocations with respect to these increased prices, and so on. And, and each of these processes, there are two processes here, they keep building on the improvements of the other process. Okay. And somehow, this is a, a very, very powerful paradigm, uh, that, that you have two processes, and, and each is improving on the improvements made by the other process. You know, just like very, very much similar to uh, when two people start solving, working on a problem. Uh, and that's much more powerful than just one person working on a problem, because you can always you know, you can make some improvement and then give it to the other person to think for themselves. And I mean, they have some other thought, thought processes which makes the problem move in some other direction, and then you make it, make it make some other improvements, and so on. Um, so, so an amazingly powerful paradigm, this one. Uh, OK, so, so to make this uh, paradigm work, though, uh, I have to tell you 
a few things. First of all, how do you make sure that the equilibrium price of a good is never exceeded? Right? Because if it's exceeded, then we have to bring it down, and, and we don't know how to then bound the running time. Uh, and for this, we have an invariant that, that S should be a min cut in this, in this network. So we, we have this network relative to whatever prices we start with, and we make sure that this is a min cut. So if we set, send max flow, all of these goods will be sold, and there may be surplus money left over here. And that ensures that you, you haven't exceeded the equilibrium price of uh, any good. And then uh, this, there's this notion of a tight set. So, so, so when, uh, let's say, if suppose prices are such that P1 plus P2 equals M1 plus M2 plus M3. In other words, uh, the total value of these goods equals the total money possessed by buyers interested in these goods. Then if we imp increase the prices anymore, we will not be able to sell these goods. And in fact, as this will not be a min cut. The min cut will go something like this then, like that. Okay? So, so that's, these are called tight sets, and they indicate the fact that the min cut is just about to, to get uh, violated. So when you get a tight set, then you have to freeze these prices. And, uh, and then there are many other steps to the algorithm, which I will not get into unless uh, people want it, and I can do you, uh, give you all the details in the end. Uh, but we have to make sure that these steps, whatever they are, uh, that I've hidden under, under the rug, um, they, they happen fast, that rapid progress is made, that these, you don't have exponentially many of these steps before you find equilibrium prices. Yes, sir? I, I'm a little confused as to, in general, what's going on, because we know how to solve max flow. Yeah. Um, so why not just solve it and look at the flow going through these infinite capacities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the the the, the max flow is not enough. So uh, what we're going to do here? Okay, good. So so we start with these very low prices, then we are increasing the prices until we can keep increasing as as long as this this uh, is a min cut. We can keep increasing prices. When this is threatened, at that point we need to stop the uh, increasing the prices, right? So we need to determine that point. And also, in the meantime, we need to make sure that these edges don't run away. Okay? So we increase these prices proportionately, proportionate to each other. That makes sure that those edges remain as they are. Uh, and we do that by multiplying all these prices by a variable x, initializing x to 1 and raising x. Okay? That makes sure that these prices increase uh, proportionately, so these edges remain. And at some point, let's say a tight set happens. Maybe the, the sum of those two prices equals the money of these three buyers. Then the sum of those two prices, then those two prices are frozen, and we only increase these. Okay? When we increase these, you know, a new edge may come in. So, because those prices are not increasing, those goods are becoming better and better for this buyer. So a new edge may come in. And so these are the kinds of steps that happen, okay? which are the details that I was uh, <laughs> not willing to get into. And, and, and you keep doing these, these, these improvements. And in each of these iterations, some at least one of these prices keeps increasing. And so the surplus of these buyers keeps decreasing. And hopefully, it terminates with zero surplus on the buyers. And then you have equilibrium. Yes, sir? So one thing from a high level description, it seems like it's possible to happen. It sounds like it doesn't. If the fact that is you're approaching the equilibrium prices, your step size is actually getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what, what leads you, what is the intuition as to why the decrease in the, yeah. the derivative is smaller than Yeah, good the point. Update? Excellent point. So what we can show is that, that when goods freeze, uh, the denominator of the prices is, is bounded. You cannot have arbitrarily uh, small so, so, so uh, you cannot have arbitrarily small denominators. Okay, so the denominator is bounded, and that shows that that between two freezings there must be a a, a certain uh, a minimum increase in the prices. Some so there's granula, granularity in the problem, and the and the, the step size doesn't become smaller than that. Okay, so that's that's an excellent question. Yeah. This seems to depend crucially on the assumption that the utility of a user i for a good j is, is linear. 
Well, it, the, you can't express you. If I go to buy a car, I might look at Fords, I might look at Chevys, but my value for a Ford is, is dependent on the fact that I don't buy a Chevy, right? I only want one car, but I'm looking at two different goods, which mm -hmm. are dependent upon each other. So the utility of my, mm -hmm. my utility for these two goods is dependent upon each other. Uh, well. I have utility for well, some, I mean, something like the sum of these two. No, I mean, you, you have some a priori utility for a Ford and for a Chevy, and then you go to the market, and then depending on the price, you say, okay, this is better bang for, bang for a buck for me, and then, I, then you buy that. End of story. That's the process we are considering. We're not going into the, the next round of thinking that, okay, now that I bought a Chevy, am I also going to buy a Ford, and if it is, you know, whatever. So the, the, the market model was the one that I gave earlier, uh, the very simple one where we have these utilities for goods and we go out and get an optimal bundle. And once we get that, the story ends for us. There's no second round of you know, afterthoughts. Right, but you, you assume that you can express the utility uniquely in terms of that good. Yeah, I, I, independent look, of all of there the are goods. many different ways to think about utility, okay? And I'm gonna, actually defined to you, uh, for you a, 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 a very different way of thinking about it. What you're giving me is yet another way of thinking about utility. Okay, You can bring in all kinds of bells and whistles into it, no question about it. I'm thinking of a very simple utility function, where there's no issue of any afterthoughts after having bought something. The whole question is, what are you going to buy, once and for all? And so, so yeah, my main uh, uh, presentation here is that utility function. Really, in some sense. Okay, so, so to make sure that rapid progress is made, we have this notion of a balance flow. And now I'm, I'm, I'm getting technical. Please uh, raise your hands if you don't want me to pursue this line too much further. So uh, what's a balance flow? So this was the network that we had with prices and, and monies and buyers and goods and these bank per bar edges. And... Uh, and let's say, let's, with respect to any max flow F in this graph, let's look at uh, the surplus capacity of this edge, okay? Which is the, the money that buyer I came to the market with minus the flow on this edge, I to T, okay? That's the surplus capacity there. And the surplus vector is the vector of surpluses with respect to this uh, flow F. And uh, a balanced flow is a max flow that minimizes the L2 norm of the surplus vector. The L2 norm being the uh, sum of the squares of the components square root. Or, or equivalently, you could be maximizing, minimizing the L2 square norm. And what on earth does that have to do with anything here? Well, there's a fantastic property that comes with this uh, balanced flow, which is critical in the algorithm, and I will not go into that because because to tell you how it fits into the algorithm is uh, a lot of uh, detail. In any case, there's a, this, this property characterizes balance flows with respect to all max flows in this uh, network. And, uh, and these pieces that I've just introduced, uh, these bank per buck edges, the invariant, the tight sets, and these balance flows, these pieces fit just right and make the algorithm happen. And, and, and in fact, this... Uh, this property one of balance flows saves the moment in a way that is, uh, I mean, it's very scary. I'm almost thinking that there's a bug here, but it goes through. Um, so, so that was the gist of the algorithm. Uh, and, and here's the part where I wanted to show you, if, if, you, if you wish, uh, how this primal dual schema is adapted to this nonlinear setting. Um, So what we want is a convex program whose optimal solution is equilibrium allocations. Okay? Uh, and of course, the constraints in this convex program should be packing constraints on these variables x, i, j. But the question is, what should the objective function be? And the objective function should somehow maximize the utilities of all the buyers. And here are some... Uh, conditions that the objective function should satisfy. So here, every 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 duck uh, came with uh, 
his or her own util utility function, and something that, that they themselves told us, right? Now, if this duck is going to multiply all of her utilities by 200, that will still be her utility function, and it hasn't changed anything. What is important is how, how much this duck wants uh, these goods relative to each other. And so, so if you scale the utilities by any constant, the optimal allocation should remain unchanged. That should be certainly satisfied. Secondly, if uh, we take Uncle Scrooge here and split his money among two, two other ducks, uh, and their utility functions are identical to that of uh, Uncle Scrooge, and we solve this equilibrium problem, get the allocations for these two ducks, and give that alloc the union of these two, al two allocations to Uncle Scrooge, that should be an optimal allocation for Uncle Scrooge also. Okay? That's a reasonable property that follows from linearity. And the unique objective function that helps you do that is this money-weighted geometric mean of the utilities. So this is the total utility of buyer I, total money of buyer I. Okay. So if I remove this part, that's still okay. And if I take the log of this, that's still okay. And that's what we'll use. So, so that's the, the, uh, the objective function. Summation of MI log UI, where UI is the total happiness of buyer I. And this is the constraint that only one unit of good uh, J is sold. And of course, all the allocations have to be non-negative. And this was given by Eisenberg and Gale. Uh, you may have heard of David Gale. He's the famous Gale of the Gale-Shapley algorithm for stable marriage. He's a professor at uh, Berkeley, and Eisenberg was also a professor at Berkeley at some point. Uh, uh, it, it's in some sense the, because of those two issues. The, 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 those two issues are there's you know, essentially one, one function that satisfies those properties. So this looks a little bit like entropy. Does that mean anything, or is it just a mm, Not like entropy, actually. More like uh, Nash's bargaining problem. So the, the, the dual or variables or the Lagrange variables corresponding to these constraints will be the prices. And that's how we run the primal dual algorithm. And using these KKT conditions, uh, we can show that optimal allocations, so the, the optimal values of these will be equilibrium allocations for Fisher's model. And uh, there are just two things I want to say about it in order to speed things up, which is that, uh, that in this case, in our algorithm, there are two big points of departure. The first one is that whereas in a normal uh, uh, primal dual algorithm, uh, these complementary slackness conditions are satisfied in a discrete manner, one per iteration, here they are satisfied these KKT conditions are satisfied in a continuous process. And uh, after this uh, talk, I can you know, describe to anybody who's interested in, in this part. Uh, and so this question of finding a strongly polynomial algorithm for, for this problem becomes a, a really a, a good open problem, because this, this continuous process uh, takes polynomial time, but not strongly polynomial time. And uh, because these KKT conditions are much more involved than complementary slackness conditions of uh, linear programming, uh, what happens is that these edges in this uh, network that I was talking about, they appear and disappear. And that kind of a, 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 a change, algorithmic change, also is difficult to handle uh, in terms of running time. And that's the other uh, uh, big hurdle that we had to cross. So I will not uh, get into the huge amount of technicalities involved here. Instead, uh, if you want, I can uh, seek a question, or else I have uh, another plan of action, which is uh, to throw a few eggs at this linear utility functions. Yes? If you want to read, uh, is that the same paper that talks about the uh, relaxes the linearity conditions on the utility and just makes them uh, concave? Uh, no, that's the next paper. That's the next yeah, I'll, I'll give you the, the URLs for the two papers. Yes, sir? Uh, so this uh, primal dual thing is sort of rem reminiscent of Gibbs sampling. I wonder if you've considered 
at giving a stochastic variant to this? Ah, uh, no, that's that's a little bit distant from our, our, our plan, but we should talk about it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so here we've uh, dealt with linear utility functions, uh, but these are sort of uh, very primitive because, as uh, our friend remarked here, uh, the buy a buyer typically ends up spending all her uh, money on only a single good, unless there are accidents and she likes two or more goods, or two or more goods give her the same bang for buck at equilibrium. Also, this model doesn't uh, satisfy the fact that uh, buyers could get satiated with goods. You know, they, they keep getting the same happiness over any amount of good received. So concave utility functions are uh, very nice from both these points of view, and they give rise to uh, very expressive uh, utility functions. Um, and the economists love them. Uh, but uh, they do not satisfy this key monotonicity property, which is actually satisfied li by linear utility functions, and which is the reason that that algorithm that I gave you works. Uh, and uh, and uh, getting a polynomial time algorithm for concave utility functions remains as a very key big open problem. So after this uh, algorithm got done, I started working on piecewise linear and concave utility functions, just because uh, a single piece of this is is just the linear utilities. Okay, so when you have more than one piece, you get something more general. Uh, and the reason also was that if this gets solved, then we can uh, we can uh, um, approximate any concave utility functions by these piecewise linear and concave, and get some kind of a, an approximation algorithm for the concave case. Okay, and these uh, piecewise linear ones also do not satisfy weak cross substitutability. Uh, uh, but anyway. Um, after having put in a fair amount of work, I thought I had the entire algorithm for this case. And it was a moment of great joy before it came a moment of great disappointment when I <laughs> <laughs> discovered a pretty serious bug in that algorithm, basically coming out of the fact that the weak gross uh, substitutability was not satisfied, which is not a notion that I knew at that point five years ago, because uh, I'm picking up uh, general equilibrium theory as I was going along. Um, so I was I was quite desperate to uh, to salvage whatever I could of these ideas, which had taken so long to to gel. Uh, and then the following idea came up, uh, uh, namely, first of all, let's uh, differentiate this uh, piecewise linear curve. Okay, and uh, oops, what we get? Yeah. So if you differentiate it, we'll get this step decreasing function. Okay, what does this mean? So, let's say there's this buyer who's uh, buying chocolates, and uh, uh, this is the rate at which she gets happiness per chocolate eaten for so many chocolates eaten. Okay, and then she gets happiness at this rate per chocolate eaten for so many chocolates eaten, and then at this rate per chocolate eaten, and so on. And uh, we hope she stops at some point. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but that's, that's what it means, right? OK, so, so there's really no change right now. I, all I've done is differentiate, and that doesn't give rise to any new, new function. But now, what I want is that instead of the abscissa being amount of chocolates, should be the amount of money spent on chocolates. OK, so I'm asking this buyer to give me her happiness in a different form altogether, which is quite unrelated from the previous function. I'm telling her to tell me at what rate is she deriving happiness per chocolate eaten as a function of the amount of money spent on chocolates. Okay. So she could be deriving rate happiness at this rate per chocolate eaten for the first $10 spent on chocolates, and then at this rate for the next $15 spent on chocolates, and so on. Okay. <laughs> Can we go somewhere else? Uh, we no. can try. <coughs> okay. 
Okay. He has to give this information without knowing the price. Without knowing the price. If you know the price, you can translate between one and yes. the other. But this is a, that's why this is a totally different utility function. Okay. Okay, but it, it makes sense. Let me show you why. Okay. Now, okay, so, so I call these spending constraint utility functions. Okay. And the second thing uh, I did was to extend the model so that buyers also have happiness for money, which is a question that was asked. And uh, all of that also works out. And this guy is very happy because you know, he's very stingy and he likes to take back money home. So this, this, is, this is good for him. And with all these changes, I, I managed to get a polynomial time algorithm. Okay. And again, equilibrium prices are unique. And uh, what happened really in, in retrospect was that Okay, great. Thank you. So, so weak gross substitutability, this key monotonicity condition came back somehow, and uh, that's what made the algorithm work out. But in the meantime, everything became much, much more complex. All these pieces that I showed you became twisted and turned, and new pieces came in, but still, you know, they managed to fit just right somehow. And that's the, the wonderful thing. And that's how the polynomial time algorithm came about. And uh, uh, this, this model, I, I must say, is, is, is more in, in the line of Don Patinkin's uh, work in economics than Walras's uh, original work. Uh, and then there was an unexpected fallout. So this has applications to Google's AdWords market, and which is the, the most important thing I want to talk about here. Okay. So, so I will leave this digression to be very, very small. Basically, there's this issue that uh, Monica Henzinger, who was the CTO of Google uh, here, gave us this problem. Find an algorithm that maximizes Google's online revenue. An online algorithm that maximizes Google's revenue. So the, the problem is that, uh, uh, oops, what's happened? Yeah, that, that, that there are these uh, uh, companies that have bid for, for these keywords, right? And they've declared their daily budget. And a user has the, uh, just typed in the query asbestos. And if, the, if Google wanted to just present one ad to her for simplicity, which one should she pick, or should Google pick? Uh, uh, there are these two uh, op options, $50, $70 bid, but $5,000 uh, daily budget, or $50 bid and $7,000 daily budget. So that's an online issue that Google needs to de decide you know, within milliseconds. And uh, so this can be presented as an online algorithms problem. And in, in these kinds of algorithms, you compare against the best offline algorithm that knows all the queries of the day beforehand and does an optimal allocation of, uh, of queries to, uh, of, key, uh, of keywords to uh, um, advertisers. And uh, I just wanted to show you that the greedy algorithm will not work here. We'll give you only half the optimal. Okay, but let's jump right through that. And oh, 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 oh. and uh, this uh, work uh, with Amin Saberi, who's at Stanford, and Aranek Mehta, who's actually been offered a job in your group somewhere, uh, in Shiva Kumar's group. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Umesh Pazarani, who's on the faculty at Berkeley, uh, my brother. Uh, we got a 1 minus 1 over E factor algorithm. Uh, and this is an uh, optimal online algorithm for this particular problem. You cannot do better. Uh, so, uh, and I, 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 oh, yeah, let me do this thing. Okay, tie up this, the threads for uh, the two minutes that I have. So, assume tomorrow that Google doesn't want to do these uh, uh, very expensive or, or rather very time-consuming and uh, uh, elaborate auctions on a daily basis or an hourly basis, but just wants to announce equilibrium prices of per click for keywords. Just the way we, when we go to the market, we don't do a, a, an auction. We said, somebody says, you know, bread is so much per, per loaf and cheese is so much per pound, okay? So the question is, how should advertisers specify their utility functions so that Google arrives at the equilibrium prices? The advantage of equilibrium prices, which, which means parity between supply and demand, is that uh, you get Pareto optimality, you get, you know, it's an efficient allocation in every possible way. So you don't want to just fix arbitrary prices, you want to do it through some systematic way. And so the question is, what kind of a utility function should you use? And of course, firstly, it has to be expressive enough that the business can 
specify its very complex uh, desires, okay? And that could mean, you know, uh, model the entire economy to find out what's their optimal allocation, but that's not what we want to do because, after all, we want efficient computability, and it should be easy to specify utilities. So, uh, linear functions are bad because throughout this, the day, the business will get only one type of query because of the issue that you raised, uh, because typically only one good is optimal in linear. Uh, concave, there's no efficient algorithm, and uh, I cannot imagine any advertiser giving you a concave function for a set of keywords <laughs> allocations, okay? So, and in fact, my central point here is that it should be easier for a, an, a business to say how much they want to spend on each kind of keyword for a given range of prices on the keywords, <coughs> rather than giving uh, any kind of a concave happiness function. Okay, so now let's assume that there's this online shoe business which has two keywords, men's clogs and women's clogs, and they have a, an advertising budget of $100 per day, and through statistical information they know that $2 per click is the expected profit on, on the first keyword and $4 per click on the second keyword. And uh, there are considerations for long-term profits are that they should be able to sell both the goods on most days, you know, not that only men's clogs on one day and women's clogs on another day. And in fact, they should have a presence in the market even if, even if both the keywords are, are uh, uh, not profitable, just because for the long-term profit of the business, these are important issues. And so all these traditional uh, utility functions will uh, not allow you to do that. They don't want you to make a uh, loss. So, so they had a very complex uh, criteria for what's a good allocation. So if both keywords are profitable, then uh, they want to, uh, uh, and if, if the better one is at least twice as profitable, then spend all $100 on that. Otherwise, spend $60 on the more profitable and 40 on the other one. <coughs> If neither keyword is profitable, then spend $20 on the more profitable one, even though it's giving you a loss, just to have a presence in the market. If only one is profitable and very profitable, then the whole $100 on that, otherwise $60 on that, that and take back $40 home. Okay, so they have some very complex uh, criteria, uh, allocation criteria like that, and uh, these particular utility functions in the spending constraint utilities will do the job. Okay. So, next, suppose that uh, Google stays with auctions, but allows the user advertisers to specify their bids in the spending constraint model, because then you can have some decreasing utilities in these steps. I just want to end by saying that that uh, uh, you all are perhaps aware of the fact that. Algorithms and game theory had uh, common origins, uh, certainly in the works of Von Neumann, who is the, uh, the founder of game theory. <coughs> and he was also you know, the, the architect of the stored program computers and, 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 and really a genuinely uh, an algorithms person very early on. And then some of the biggest figures in, uh, in algorithms and game theory were, were common people. I mean, people who were doing work in both areas, uh, Danzig, David Gale, uh, Kuhn, Scarf, Tucker, and so on. And then uh, years ago, the two, two fields uh, started moving along separate directions with very little interaction. And, and uh, about five or six years ago, or maybe seven years ago, uh, things got together again because of the internet and all the applications arising in networking and so on. And uh, there's a huge synergy here in this uh, field of algorithm game theory. Um, uh, we have a book coming out uh, I'm one of the co-editors. There are four co-editors, co co and it's, uh, there are 29 chapters from 40 authors. Um, this will be out in uh, August. And I, I just want to say that this study of markets, uh, in particular, has a, um, a huge uh, potential uh, to give rise to new ideas, certainly uh, in game theory, uh, like the ones for Google's AdWords market, uh, for algorithms, for math programming. There are some very interesting open problems here. And uh, very recently, together with uh, uh, Ramesh Johari of Stanford and uh, Nick uh, Feimster of, uh, of Georgia Tech, uh, we proposed uh, uh, a new architecture for internet, internet, uh, internet uh, uh, connectivity, which uh, 
is based on a free market principle. So, so, so it turns out that you know, although the internet uh, hosts all these fantastic mar uh, markets, and you have employed uh, you know the best economists in the world to come and uh, give you the best principles to run these markets, uh, the underlying connectivity market of the internet is run in the most primitive and in the most inefficient way. Uh, there are this huge amount of connectivity that's never utilized because these two ASs never got into a dark alley to shake their hands and form a business relationship, uh, or, or you know, the, the the routes chosen are, are extremely long when they could have just gotten two uh, routers that are co-located in the same building to have a common uh, link, and you know, get a much more efficient path. None of these things are happening because there's just the, the whole system is based on a very primitive, essentially a bartering kind of a, a system, whereas we could be using uh, some of these principles from mathematical economics. And so what we have proposed is a new architecture, uh, and uh, uh, Nick Feimster just uh, uh, gave a talk on it uh, at uh, Princeton, uh, uh, that was yesterday, and, and, and got some amazing feedback, from, especially from the industrial uh, folks that were there. So I just want to say that the study of markets is really a key study, uh, key, key, key aspect of algorithmic game theory. And uh, we can expect a lot of uh, benefit from it. So thank you.